evening. If you'll go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Acts, uh, we will be there this evening as we continue our way through the book. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6 in just a moment. Uh, before we get to Acts chapter 6, though, I, I want to make some uh, clarifying remarks real quick. Uh, last couple of weeks ago, we did Acts chapter 5, and we spent some time talking about some explanations as to how Gamaliel uh, would have had his, or how Luke would have understood what Gamaliel had said in the private conference there. And uh, several have asked me some clarifying questions about that. And I've learned if somebody has a question, it means they weren't paying attention. If more than one person has the same question, that means I was not clear enough about what I said, uh, which was the case with this one. So I wanted to make sure uh, that I, I clarified what I was saying and what I was not saying in that statement. We were talking about different explanations as to why Gamaliel's statement didn't necessarily match Josephus's statements regarding uh, the, the different false messiahs that had risen up. And I proposed a theory uh, that is merely a theory we can't really know. Uh, but because the theory kind of leaned more toward the uh, what we would qualify as inaccurate, uh, several have wondered if I was claiming that the Bible could be inaccurate. That is not the case or my goal in the explanation I was trying to give. Uh, there are several different explanations for that passage that just go with more of the unknown. You know, Josephus could have gotten his dates wrong. There could have been more than one person named Judas or Thutis. There are several explanations that are given. I want to be clear. I by no means question the accuracy of Scripture at all. Uh, I by no means want to bring any sort of question to the accuracy of Scripture. I do wonder sometimes if we don't necessarily project our own standard of accuracy on the Scripture, a modern standard that was not a, a historical standard. Uh, but I want to be clear that I don't question the accuracy of the Bible or the inspiration of Scripture. Luke had the information he had because he was guided by the Holy Spirit to have it by some way or another. And, and, and just for the sake of there being no misunderstanding, I want to make sure we understand that. Uh, if ever there is an error in our understanding of Scripture, it is an error in our understanding and not in the Scriptures. Uh, I read a passage this morning, or I alluded to a passage this morning in James chapter 3, about teachers, let not many of you be teachers because we'll be judged by a stricter standard. And I take that very seriously. Uh, and for several people to have that question regarding what I taught a couple of weeks ago, it means I did not state that clearly enough. And so please understand, the scriptures are God's word, not Adam's word. And, and that in and of itself should be enough for us in trying to make sure that we are under or that that the Bible is the true answer. Um, I, I just again I, I don't want to leave any sort of misunderstanding that I'm I'm more comfortable with some human logic than I am with the truth of Scripture. Uh, the Scripture is true. Uh, Acts chapter six. Let's dig into that this evening. Acts chapter six, starting in verse one. I, it, we're going to read us fairly short section of scripture here. And uh, I, I want to go ahead and just read the whole passage since it is so short and then spend some time talking about it this evening. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The twelve sons the whole company of the disciples and said it would not be right for us to give up teaching or give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from your, among, your, among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Chorus, Nicanor, T 
Timon, Parmenius, and Nicolaus, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. As we carry on in this story, we have so far encountered a church that has has been born uh, from that first sermon and the 3,000 who were baptized on that day of Pentecost. And it has grown significantly. Uh, We've already seen that it has expanded beyond 5,000 men. Uh, It continues to grow here in chapter 6. So the church is a large group of believers. And they are all at this point still in Jerusalem. They are still there working together to try to try to share the gospel and, and teach that Jesus is the Messiah that all of these Jews in Jerusalem have been expecting. But a problem rises. And it, it I, I would go so far as to say, in some ways, it's a semantic problem. Uh, you, you put yourself in their shoes. That was a lot of organization and administration that had to happen to take care of this large amount of people. If you remember in the story, many of these thousands of believers are not from Jerusalem. They are there by necessity in order to hear the apostles' doctrine, to break bread, to devote themselves to fellowship and to prayer. They are there out of place being supported by the generosity and the the sharing of the Christians in that area. And we read about several of these who have done that, and we've already talked about those in our series here in the book of Acts. But in the sharing of the food, in the administrating of the goods, in the making sure that everybody gets the food that they're supposed to get, there are some who are being neglected. That is a semantic problem. There are times when you're administering that there is going to be uh, gaps. There's going to be failures in the system. There are going to be people who get overlooked. Those things happen. The problem in this particular case, though, is that it is being interpreted, or maybe is, also a racial problem. Notice the detail here is that the complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews. It wasn't just a complaint that some were being neglected. It was a complaint against one group of people against another group of people, and they are identified. You've got the Hellenistic complaining about the, uh, the, the Hebrew, he, Hebraic. There you go. I knew I was butchering that word. Hellenistic and Hebraics. You've got some who are not from the region of Israel. They are those who have stayed in a foreign land back from the captivity and the return from captivity. They are people who have come to town in order to be, uh, to, to be faithful Jews, but they have heard the gospel and they are staying in town to hear more of the gospel. They are complaining that the locals, and not necessarily locals as in those from Jerusalem, but the locals, meaning those there in Israel, were discriminating against their widows because they weren't giving them food. You don't just have hungry people. You have offended people. And that's a problem. I don't know if you've observed this over the years. One of the things I've seen in the Lord's church again and again is that if it can be a problem, it will be a problem. You notice that? Somebody somewhere is going to get offended about something at some time. Just the way it works. People love to be offended. They don't like to necessarily directly be neglected, but they like to be offended about someone else being neglected. It is amazing to see the woke movement these days. You know what's interesting to me about the woke movement, which is the idea of all these people who are now wise and and informed 
important enough that they can relate to and sympathize with those who have been neglected or discriminated against. And so they are now woke because they have woken up to see all of the problems in the world. What's interesting to me about the woke movement is how many of them are the discriminated. They're just the ones complaining about the ones being discriminated against, and they're offended by it. Kind of what you see going on here. There was a racial problem. And again, I don't know that it truly was a racial problem. I don't know that there were Hebraic Jews deliberately neglecting certain widows because they came from another place. It doesn't really read that way. What it says is a complaint arose that this was what was thought was happening. The Hellenistic widows were being neglected. Well, we've got a problem now. Because it's not just hungry people, but it's offended people. And again, another observation from my short 40, almost 41 years, is this. Offended people tend to not be rational people. You ever notice that? Offended people aren't generally looking for solution. They're looking for the ability to complain. So what you have here, and again, I'm not saying discriminated people. Oftentimes, discriminated people are looking for a solution. But those who are woke, those who are offended, those who are complaining, complainers love to complain. Well, the truth is, this was actually a very simple problem. And you know it's simple because of how quickly the apostles come up with the solution. Notice that it does not read in here that this complaint has arisen, that their widows were being overlooked in the distribution. And so the twelve gathered together, and they called together a council of wise Christians to commiserate and figure out what it is they should do in solution, and they spent about 30 days figuring out what all the possible ways that they could solve this issue were. Does it read that way? I I love just how very simple the apostles approach this. The 12 summon the whole company of the disciples. They say, all right, everybody get together. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to choose seven men, and they're going to take care of it. Done. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? They didn't get all caught up in all of the complaints. They didn't get caught up in the racial slurs or the racial discrimination. They didn't get caught up in who said this and who said that and who's being ugly and who's being kind. They didn't get into any of the us versus them. They just said, solved. We put the power back into your hand. I love that. I love it. And the reason I love it is because of the attitude of the apostles is this. It says it twice. First, verse 2, it would be not right for us to give up the preaching. That's not our job. We're not going to not do what we are called to do in order to handle other problems. We're going to put that power in your hand. They go on to say a little bit later, verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Not the distribution of the food, not the waiting on tables, not the we're going to handle all of the complaints, we're going to make sure that we set up a complaint board and we got someone to listen to all of the different bickerings and fights and all of that sort of thing. They don't, they don't do any of that. They just say, you know what? We'll handle the problem and we'll move on because we're not going to be distracted from the work. The apostles refused to be distracted. Choose seven men. You know who are not one of the seven men? Any of the twelve. You ever notice that? I, I find it interesting that they didn't say, all right, so we know there's a problem. Matthew, you're really good with numbers and counting and administration. You, know, you were a tax collector all those years, so 
Matthew, we're going to put you over this commission of men who are going to handle this problem because we need one of us in the mix to make sure that the problem gets taken care of properly. You know how often I see that be the method? That's not the apostles' method, no. Their job is not to wait on tables. It is to pray and preach. That's it. That's what they're going to do. Pray and preach. So you choose seven men, and those seven men are going to take care of this problem because we're going to give them the authority and the power to handle it. And we're going to stay focused on our job. I love this quote by Paul Myers. Productivity is never an accident. It is always the result of commitment to excellent, intelligent planning and focused effort. Don't you see that in the way the apostles handle this? They, they said, you know what? It, our job, pray and preach. We recognize there's a problem. We're going to make sure the problem gets taken care of by choosing these seven men who can take care of it so that the rest of us don't have to sit around and argue about it. We don't have to sit around and think that there's going to be some sort of, uh, of racial divide within the church. We're not dividing up over the distribution of food. What we do is more important than that. We are going to choose seven men. They're going to take care of the problem. We're all going to move forward. I love that. And I love that they could say it so much shorter than what I just said. <laughs> I mean, they, they just said, seven men, go. And they do it. They take care of it. So they do. They choose seven men. Now, look with me again. Seven men. They choose Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Heman, Harminus, and Nicolaus who is a proselyte or a convert from Antioch. The common theme of these names is that they are Hellenistic names. Greek names. They chose seven men who would be sympathetic to the needs of the Hellenistic widows. And not only are they Hellenistic, but they are men of good reputation. Everybody agrees that these men are good, virtuous, honest men. If there's a job that needs to be done, these are the men who are already doing the job that needs to be done. That, that's how reputation works. You don't gain a reputation from being chosen. You gain a reputation from doing the work before you're chosen. You ever notice that? You, you gain the reputation by being the person of character and integrity that, require, that, that helps people see who you really are. These men have already been doing the work of serving and helping and being servant to those around them. That's, that should be all of us. That they are men that are full of the Spirit, it says. Full of the Spirit. You, you can interpret that a lot of different ways. If you interpret that with a big S, like what I have on the screen, that's what's in the Christian Standard Bible, it means that they are men who are who are full of the Holy Spirit. They are men who, who, who have exhibited maybe even the power of the Holy Spirit. I tend to wonder if it doesn't just mean spirit small s. Meaning these are men who are, who are known for their, for their character, for their involvement, for their dedication. That they, that if you were to say, hey, who, who exemplifies Christ in this group? They would go, that man, that man, that man, that man, that man, that man, that man. They're full of the Spirit. They, they've got the character. They've got the qualities. They are the kind of men who exemplify who we're supposed to be. 
They're that kind of men. Men full of wisdom, it says. Wisdom. How do you know if somebody has wisdom? That's the kind of question we need to be asking because that's the kind of question you would ask, let's say we had decided we needed to choose a few new elders or we needed to choose uh, more, more leadership with, within the congregation. You're going to look for men that, that are full of good reputation, they, they're full of the spirit, they're, they're full of wisdom. How do you know if somebody's full of wisdom? You've lived life with them. You've seen the choices that they've made. You see the kind of man they are in their family, maybe. That, that might not apply with these seven men, but it definitely applies when we're choosing elders. Uh, you, you, you see the way that they treat their spouse. You see the way that they, they love their children. You see the way that they treat other brethren. You see the way they act in their lives. You see the way that they handle themselves when adversity arises, when they face conflict of some sort. Doesn't all of that feed into this idea of being full of wisdom? I mean, there's really no quantitative way to judge that. Of, okay, well, they, they're, they're, it's 9 out of 10, so they're full of wisdom. Like, What list would you work off of? The way you know somebody's full of wisdom is you watch the way they live, and if they live according to wisdom, they made the choices that exemplify wisdom, then you recognize they're full of wisdom. These men were full of faith. Full of faith. The way I would understand that mean is it, these are men who are dedicated to what the church was all about. These are men who, who acted in faith. These are men who, who said, if this is what God wants, this is what we do. We see that being very true in the lives of two of them a little bit later that we're going to get to. When we read the story of Stephen in chapter 7, or the rest of 6 in chapter 7, when we read the story of Philip and the work that he does as an evangelist over in chapter 8, we're going to see them acting on faith going where God tells them to go, saying the things that God would have them to say, even standing in the face of, of being stoned in the, pace, in the case of Stephen, facing execution. These are the men they choose. And here's what I find interesting about that. These are not qualities of good administrators. These are qualities of good servants. If the task were just, we need someone to make a spreadsheet and put everybody's, uh, all the widows' names on it and make sure that we have a, a morning and an evening column for each of these widows and, and just check it off every time we hand them their daily ration. Make sure they're checked off. If that were the task, you don't need men that are full of spirit and wisdom and faith. But if the task was standing before a, a group of God's people and helping them calm down over what is a probably a fabricated complaint about racial division in this case, sure, I mean, there, I, I don't doubt that there's racial tensions. I don't doubt that there were uh, legitimate complaints between the Hebraic and the Hellenistic Jews, that, but Christ erased all of that. By becoming Christians, they gave up their identity found in the Mosaic Law, and they gained an identity found in Christ, and Christ made them all the same. Right? Well, if that's the case, they needed some servants who were full of wisdom and spirit and faith, who could remind people of that, who could patiently guide and direct people through what was probably a volatile time in order to help them see they belong to something better. 
I think all that's important because we in our own churches face similar problems where we feel some have been neglected and maybe they're neglected the complaint is because of their poverty because of their background because of their sin because of their race because of their gender because of their circumstances because of the way they dress or the way they look and what we need are servants who are willing to remind us as God's people that we're above all of that. That's no longer a part of who we are. My identity is not found in my heritage. It's found in my Savior. And that should be my focus. I love that these seven men are chosen and they're brought before the apostles. And it says the apostles prayed for them and laid their hands on them. That doesn't necessarily mean they gave them these spiritual gifts like we, we read of laying on of hands and other passages of Scripture. That was a, just a way of showing approval. It was a way of showing uh, blessings. And so here you've got the apostles uh, standing in front of these seven men who have been chosen. And, and I would imagine that the apostles know these men just as well as everybody else knows these men because they're men of good reputation and full of spirit and full of wisdom and full of faith. And so these are men who have been, who have been servants and they've, they've gained a reputation for themselves for the kind of work that they do. And I can imagine the apostles standing there smiling, going, yep, I knew it would be these seven. They lay their hands on them, and they pray for them. Notice, it doesn't say, the apostles said, okay, now here's what we want you to do, or here's how we want you to handle it, or here's your budget. The apostles aren't involved in any of the administration here, as far as I can tell. They are focused on prayer and preaching. And they give full approval and authority to these seven men. There are so many lessons in this. But I'm going to tell you one or two that stand out to me as a preacher. I'm not an elder. Not of that quality yet. I will fully admit it. I'm working on it. I, tell, I have a hard time letting go of jobs. I have a hard time as a preacher not getting distracted with the day-to-day -day things so that I can focus on the more important things. Not, not that my things are necessarily more important than anybody else's. They're just, they're different. They're a different set of tasks that I have in front of me that, that the elders have asked me to handle as a minister. It is so easy for me to get bogged down with, with daily activity that I, I probably shouldn't. Uh, you know, I, I, I probably shouldn't spend a lot of time making a song supplement. Now, I'm doing it because that's just what I do. I love projects, and I get myself all wrapped up in those types of things. But I probably shouldn't. Because you know what ends up being neglected? I'm, just, I'm being honest with you here from, from the pulpit. You know what ends up getting neglected when I get myself busy on a project like that? Prayer. Prayer. Typically, it's not preaching, because if I don't show up one Sunday to preach when y'all are expecting me to show up to preach, I'm going to hear about that later. But prayer, y'all don't know whether I pray for you or not. That's something I do in my private time and oftentimes when I busy myself with the project I neglect what is the greater task of prayer it, it, now, ideally I should just do both I, I recognize that but it 
it, it's one of those things. I can see that being a struggle for someone in any sort of leadership position, whether you are an elder or a deacon or a preacher or whether it's being the head of your family or if it's the head of your job or wherever it is that you find yourself with some sort of, of tasks that are thrown on you, it is so easy to let those little tasks distract you from what really are the greater things you should be doing. We got to be careful about that. Let me relate that to what we talked about this morning with, with church growth. I mentioned it, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but how often is it that we can distract ourselves from the great mission of sharing the gospel for the sake of pursuing some project as a congregation. We can get ourselves so bogged down with Bible classes that we spend all of the time that we have to dedicate to the Lord doing that, and we spend little to no time actually sharing the gospel with somebody. It's dangerous. That's distracting. And good things can become distractions if you let them. I don't think any of the 12 apostles heard the complaint that had arisen from the Hellenistic Jews about the Hebraic Jews and thought, well, this isn't important. We'll just ignore it. That wasn't, that wasn't the way to handle it. But it also wasn't to pull themselves away from what was the greater task to accomplish something of lesser importance. We need to be careful about that. Let me also say that this second lesson related to the first lesson for me is the importance of prayer. I talked this morning about, about ministering, about teaching, about sharing God's truth. That's not everyone's season of life. I'll use my wife as an example. She's raising and homeschooling five children. She doesn't have evening after evening after evening to go and study the Bible with somebody. It's, it's just, it's not time available for her. Uh, it might be that you're in a season of life where you're not around people as much. You've retired. You don't see people on a daily basis. There are some days where you don't see anybody. Who are you going to teach? I understand that. Here's the part I didn't mention this morning that I think is probably important for us to remember. The first step of evangelism is prayer. It's praying for opportunity. It's praying for those you know who are having Bible studies with people. It's praying for courage. Uh, Paul oftentimes asks for prayers regarding his own courage. We can be doing that for our brethren, for ministers, for elders. Uh, it, prayers need to be offered on behalf of, of the, the flock here for our strength and our growth. Prayers need to be offered that if we start growing, that we will grow in a way that our elders are able to handle and help new Christians mature. There's a lot of things we need to be praying for. And that's kind of the first step to, to evangelism, to growth. And I love the way this is worded. You see, they say, we can't neglect the preaching. We can't neglect the time that we must spend in prayer and in sharing the Word of God. And so the conclusion of this story, of this problem that arose, the complaint that happened, this racial divide is this. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number and the large group of priests became obedient to the faith. You see that? It, I, I think we would expect to read this complaint rose up and so uh, uh, things started falling apart and then all of a sudden the church was just struggling and, and, and people started leaving in droves. That's what we expect to read based probably on what many of our own personal experiences have been over the years. They faced a problem face, you know, just, just head first. 
They faced it without any hesitation. They faced it, handled it, moved forward, and moved forward in such a way that they continued to grow. And not just grow, but grew among a group of people that you wouldn't expect them to grow with. He converted priests. You know, I love the story of the book of Acts because in about every single way, it slaps me across the face and says, Adam, wake up! Wake up to the possibilities. Wake up to what God can do. Wake up to realize all these things we get upset about and and get worried about shouldn't be worries. You know, if we're treating people right, we don't have a racial divide. If we're extending the hand of fellowship and the offer of salvation, to everyone around us, no matter their situation or their wealth or their skin color or their gender. We're out there sharing the gospel with people and we're praying for every person we come into contact with that we might have an opportunity to open the door for them to know the hope that comes from knowing Jesus. That's the way we acted and thought. Problems move us forward, not backwards. The book of Acts is just glorious. I, I tell you, it, it really makes everything simple. <laughs> we make it complicated. That, that's what I've noticed over the years. We come up with elaborate plans on how we're going to avoid trouble. And then when we face trouble, we come up with elaborate plans on how we're going to fix troubles. When the answer is really simple. Pray and be focused on the things you're supposed to be focused on. That's it. Simple answer. There's an administrative problem. Choose somebody to take care of it. Pray, preach. But if we'll just keep at the work of praying and preaching... Much of the rest of it takes care of itself. If you're not a child of God, I don't know what's holding you back. But I want to know. Because you know my job, I'm not an apostle, but my job is to pray for you and to teach you. If I can do I, I, I can't do that if I don't know you're struggling. I can't do that if I don't know your questions. I want you to let me know what your questions are. What are your hesitations? What are the things that are holding you back? What is keeping you from making the decision to have your sins washed away in baptism and to belong to God? I want to help you see the answers. And and if you're not a child of God and you've got questions about that, see me tonight afterwards. Let's talk about it. If you're not a child of God and you know the answers to those questions, then what's holding you back? Become a child of God. Know Jesus as your Savior. Let him, let his sacrifice take care of your sin. There's no greater hope. There's no greater solution than the one that comes from just belonging to him. If we can help you in some way by helping you become a child of God or maybe even just praying for you, please come forward and let us know how we can help you as we stand and sing this song.